We're going to be doing a third place match preview, a finals preview, and have some special guests along the way. Stick Say and then later Rick Fox will be joining us. Hi guys. Yes. Very good. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited and uh, very thankful that everyone came out to join us. All these beautiful people that we cannot see because uh -huh. of the lights. But, <laughs> but we're sure that you're beautiful. Blinded. Yeah, first episode of the dive we've been doing in front of a live audience. We live streamed one of them last year. I checked, we've done 46 episodes uh, all time. So okay. we can start that count as well. Close so. to 50. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. We can bring Stixay on right away as well because he's here to help us preview up the matchup. So mm -hmm. he'll be coming up uh, soon. Let's start as we get Stixay up here on the third, fourth match. Echo Fox uh, had the bye, was <laughs> unable to convert once again, and then Clutch is the other team who'd made it in a five game loss. As yeah, well. and it's pretty funny too. Like talking to both teams, it's even more extreme than, than we kind of think about it because Clutch mm -hmm. Gaming, Fabivin in his interview afterwards was like, oh yeah, we're losing 90% of our scrims. Mm -hmm. you know, we were surprised kind of to make it this far. And then Echo Welcome. Fox. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, Echo Fox, and we talked about him. <laughs> DK said he was going to do a roll onto the stage. He promised me a backflip. There was no roll, there was no backflip. Yeah. Uh, I, was I was going to do the faker tumble, but... <laughs> There's really not the space for the faker tumble. Yeah, that's true. But the bigger tumble attempt would yeah. have been good. Anyways, uh, yeah, Echo Fox had been saying that they were winning like 90% of their screams also. So they were more extremely disappointed, uh, you know, in being there. So they're kind of heading into the this third place match with very different, from very different starting positions. Yeah, and I mean, even if Clutch is struggling in scrims though, their stage performances have been pretty good, right? They went, they went very good. actually, you know, pretty dominant over TSM. They go five games in the semis. Uh, they're actually coming off of, I think, a pretty big high as far yeah. as where their expectations were versus where they have ended up, and and they have the potential to actually, you know, make to rip rivals. Yeah, third and Stixay, talking, um, unfortunately, COG didn't make playoffs this year, but you've been in the third, fourth match before after losing in semifinals. Like, how do you expect these teams to regroup for the third place match since it actually is really important for championship points as well as rift rivals? Right. So I think when I played the third, fourth place match, it was in like summer, and it didn't really mean anything to us. So it was like it's almost like we went to the event as like losers and okay. it was like but we're still going to try to like you know prove like our dignity and like just win the third place match and that was like last split versus uh, Dignitas when we played with them mm -hmm. but I think for these teams they you know even though they're not in the finals which you know it kind of sucks but they still have to realize that this has really like big implications on like their world seating for an split. so they just have to do their best and still try to win. How much do you think like international experience actually matters you know for looking forward towards worlds obviously they can't make MSI but Getting third does mean you get to go to Rift Rivals, does mean you get to play against and scrim against some of the best European teams. Like, does that factor into motivation to trying to actually win that match? Yeah, I think a lot of like pro players' motivation comes from you know wanting to go to international tournaments and play against these international teams and players and stuff like that that are super hype. You always hear about them. And really, like everyone just wants to go there and kind of prove themselves versus like these players that everyone hypes up. So I think it's like a really big thing if they can you know go to those events. All right, so Let's start with Echo Fox a little bit, mm -hmm. because they had the largest fall of all of the teams. They, after the tenth game, I believe they were nine and one, having only lost to CLG at the start of the year, and they looked pretty much unstoppable. Uh, meta changed; they could no longer pick Callista in the bottom lane. Huni stopped taking over games, and they haven't really found a way to transition that again. Like even the bans that they had against TL, to me, were scared the whole time. They banned. What was it? it was Zaya, Jin, and Morg in every single game of that series, regardless of side. Yeah, I, I'm glad we have Stixa here because a lot of the meta stuff you're talking about does revolve around bottom lane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how Caitlyn has risen up, mm -hmm. uh, and he's an expert on Caitlyn as well. <laughs> Caitlyn Winter, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so, like the Echo Fox problems are twofold because you're talking about the bottom lane meta, mm -hmm. but also it seems like they were kind of unprepared for the trundle um, as far as tank shredding and then trying to play yeah. around tanks, trying to play without tanks. Uh, what, what, what was your take on that series? So, man, I just feel bad for Echo Fox because the patch hit and it instantly made, you know, top lane, the top lane carry champions is all tanks now. And then mm -hmm. bot lane was like the carry, carry lane. And I think that's the exact opposite of Echo Fox's style. So, you know, of course, they're going to be like super affected by this. And I think their bottom lane in particular has like a lot of um, champion pool problems. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. for example, Zyra Khan, they're forced to ban like one of those on blue side every single game because their bottom lane can't play it. So. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting because I, I know like the general consensus is that it's like this meta is top lane tanks and bottom lane carries and stuff. But like, 
when I watch LPL, when I watch even some of the LCK, like you still have these guys playing playing carries in the top lane, like the shy playing, you know, blind pick Fiora and stuff and slamming mm -hmm. people on IG who looks like one of the best teams right now. So it's kind of interesting because it's one of those things where I know that is what is the accepted meta right now in NA, but like Cooney feels like the kind of player that maybe could pull off the Fiora and those sorts of picks. Like, why do you guys think we're not seeing that in NA? And, and you know, maybe you have some insight from Scrims and stuff mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I think. I don't know, like I said, I think the patch just made it a bit harder to play off top lane. And I think Echo Fox has kind of realized this. And, you know, they're trying to play more like standard kind of a role where they just have a tank top and then, you know, carry bottom. And I think, you know, it's still possible. You can, honestly, you can mm -hmm. do anything in the meta. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to play carries top and win. It's just a lot harder because, you know, bot side, first turret is, you know, there's no defense on it. So you kill yeah. it faster. There's dragon, especially if it's like infernal. That's really important. You always have to play towards bottom lane. So. Yeah. So. My read on it with at least Echo Fox is they have tried to do that, and inevitably what happens in their games is they will devolve into team fighting mm. almost no matter what. So in order to have the right team fighting composition, they can't have the same top lane carries. Back when they were more dominant, I still feel like Hootie's two main picks were like Nar, GP. Even then, he'd throw back to a Vladimir if yeah. he got super head on Lucian. Like he could team fight relatively effectively on those champions, especially if the tank across from him wasn't then like being amazing in team fights. A lot of times they were in carry versus carry matchups anyway. But now, if they're just gonna neutralize on an Orn or a Cho'Gath or something like that, uh, their bottom lane's behind, and then Huni's now just trying to team fight. Um, GP's also banned every game anyway against him, so it's almost like they've been solved a little bit. Yeah, I think that was a big part of the tanks. They increased the importance of the objectives on the map that are in the middle. Uh, you know, Baron and Elder Dragon, you know, got buffs. Yeah. So people mm -hmm. are going to have these team fights more around these objectives. And Huni, like, he can play any type of champion, but even if he gets super fed on one of these split pushing champions, like, him trying to flank into one of these fights uh, was, was not, like, a good situation for Echo Fox. Or when he was splitting, like, they would have like discontinued, you know, teleport timers and stuff. It is kind of interesting to me though, because Echo Fox, it felt like they were experimenting a fair bit, but mm -hmm. less of the top lane. I mean, like Nocturne a couple times that didn't really work out for them on for Dardoch. I heard Dardoch was just super hard carrying, like twenty kill games in, in scrims and stuff. Yeah. With like, you know, that's a, that's a classic. That's like stuff. the NAJ. So but, I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what was happening in scrims, like. I just remember we played versus Nocturne, and then were you on the receiving end of those? We were on the receiving games? end and then, <laughs> of Dardoch you know, After Nocturne? one game, I'm sorry, it I'm wasn't sorry. Dardoch Nocturne, but <laughs> okay, it, was, else Nocturne. it was when Nocturne started yeah. being played. Yeah. And then it was pretty much just like, wow, this champion is pick a bent here. Like we don't know what to do. So <laughs> I mean, he's pretty feast or famine, right? Like when you are ahead and you alt in and you one shot the AD carry, it feels pretty yeah. insane. But when you're playing those games, like in those games, I remember Dardoch. It was like 15 minutes and he hadn't used his alt yet, right? So when you are not ahead, then it starts to feel pretty worthless because you get later in the game, like as lockets come in and things like that that are protecting the AD carry from getting one shot, then can't really build tank, can't really right. you know, do some other stuff. So we talked a lot about Echo Fox's problems, but I kind of want to talk about what they might be able to do to solve it mm -hmm. in the next, like from the five days since they've lost to now when they have to play on Saturday for the third place match. Uh, where do they go from here? Because I personally thought their game one strategy where they still pick Callista bottom lane, but at least had lane pressure, might have actually been one of their best comps. They just never went back to it after it stopped working. Like, what do you guys think they should try and do against Clutch to beat them? I actually felt like just them playing standard looked the best. Like, the, there was, I think it was game two or game three when they, when they actually just went to, like, they had Huni on Huni a Chogath, yeah. and then they had, like, Caitlyn bot lane that they picked away. Yeah, they won that game. And they just, like, won a straight up macro game. And the Callista, to me, especially because they were pairing it with, like, it was, like, Four or five bot lane AD carry uh, bans. Yeah, to they try played to, like, it against Caitlyn anyway. Yeah, they like threw all their bans at bottom lane, then picked the split and it felt like they were really trying to force it to work. But they were able to just play like a standard meta comp. The the two games that they tried to try to buck the trends, like the Callista game, and then also their zero tank game where they played, I think it was like Camille Kazix or something like that. I felt like they tunneled too much on trying to like maybe counter what the Trundle was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like they could just play standard, like especially when you're talking about Clutch being this team that's losing all their scrims that is. You know, not necessarily like smashing everyone. I don't see why Echo Fox can't play a normal game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because a lot of the talk is about Echo Fox because they're the more unique team. Mm -hmm. uh, but I actually feel like they probably have a higher percentage chance to actually take this series mm -hmm. over Clutch, even though Clutch was like the more standard. You're talking mm -hmm. about five to five team fighting. You know, get them to those late game team fights. Right. Uh, what about you? I mean, I still think that Echo Fox can just play a completely standard game and do fine. Uh, I think too many times they in turn try to play towards one side of the map and it actually 
messes up their plan more than anything, mm -hmm. especially in this meta. Because if you you know if you're going towards top side and your bot lane gets really behind, it's like game losing almost. So I don't know. I think they can just play a lot slower and play through all of their lanes. I think they have you know, I think their top top and mid are pretty strong laners. I think their bot is fine too. You know, they're not gonna like hard win lane, but they're fine. So I think if you just play slower, it'll actually be the best for them. Yeah, the pick and ban feels hard for that team. I know you were looking yeah. at it for a long time, but that, yeah. that's one of the more tricky. Yeah, that team was so advantaged in pick and ban when everything was about like GP NAR and the matchups yeah. up top lane because Huni literally feels like he wins both sides of that matchup most times. Now they're just defensively drafting so their bottom lane doesn't get blasted and it's just ruining their flexibility. Uh, but let's talk about Clutch as well so we can do both sides of the matchup because they had an incredibly close series against Hunter Thieves. 60, 75 minute game? 75, I think about, yeah. For game five of that series? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they're disappointed, to say the least, to actually be in the third place game. Uh, but almost a complete opposite to Echo Fox stylistically when you think about it because they do play through their bottom lane often. Febivan doesn't roam that often. Uh, and then they just wait until late game and seem to win team fights against a lot of teams. Uh, how do you think they're going to approach this matchup against Echo Fox? I, I like that you say that they're so opposite because, especially solo, like yeah. the top laners are so completely different. Even when solo is on, you know, like a NAR or something to try and split push, they rarely send many resources up to that side of the map. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very interesting to see how lopsided the early mm -hmm. games are if Echo Fox does try and go, you know, play through anything like that. I mean, I think Clutch has shown how they want to play, and I think that's like pretty much the only way that they have been playing. Right. So I think we kind of know what we're going to see. Um, they did mix it up a little bit with like they had some games in the semifinals where they actually were going top lane after almost an entire season of just kind of leaving Solo on an island. But I think they're going to mostly allow Solo to try to fend for himself, to see how he can do. And Febman's going to try to get advantages in lane and, and just try to be pushing turrets and these sorts of things. Like Febman is such a strong player and I thought he was so incredible in the semifinals that like you can afford to play this relatively slow play style and, and count on your team fighting and like kind of play off bottom lane who, who seems to get some advantages as well. Yeah, I, I, agree with, I agree with the Zale because I think the way that their bottom lane picks makes it so it's really easy to you know gank and set up bot lane stuff. Yeah. So it's really easy for them to play through the bottom lane. And then Febben, I think, almost always wins on his own. Yep. And then I think Solo does a pretty good job as well. I think people actually kind of underrate Solo, but so do I, yeah. he does a pretty good job, and he has really good clap timings in like mid game that honestly like wins him so many games. So. so do you think their main strength is actually more their mid game than anything else, or? Is I would say like their their. Yeah, I would, I would say like early to mid game. Uh, I think they just get small leads through mid and bottom, and then their top just kind of plays like a tank, but he has, he makes up for it in like team fights later. So. I'd be kind of interested to hear, so a lot of people talk about Apollo as, as this guy who's like pretty good in lane and pretty strong in mid game, but a lot of people do not have very much faith in him as like a late game team fighting <coughs> carry. So I'm uh, kind of interested to hear like what your thoughts are playing against him, especially like, you know, how do you see them as laners? How do you see them as, as kind of mm. players? I always thought Apollo was like a really good laner. Um, I think, there is like a notion that he can't really play late game just because no one has ever really seen him, you know, do much late game. Like you haven't seen like these crazy flashy plays from Apollo yeah. or anything like that. So I think people have this notion like, you know, Apollo just kind of doesn't do anything later on. He stole Baron like two I mean, times in that one game. He stole another <laughs> price with Ezreal ult. And... He stole some objectives, but uh, yeah, what but we're talking about, 5v5 five, five <laughs> team fighting. No, no, but no. was he ever in the finals at MSI? <laughs> That's true. True. <laughs> Doing the exact same draft two games in a row against SKT. Yeah. That's for honor. <laughs> yeah. We got to hit him on the salty run back. Show him yeah. the It's true. That's the first time that I saw that happen. Uh, question for you, Stixa, kind of about the draft here, because uh, in, I think each team had specific draft patterns in semifinals. Like Clutch Gaming threw bans at 100 Thieves mid lane. Like they banned Ryzen and Talia every game and then pretty early banned Swain. And then also against TL in quarters, the top lane was target banned all three games. In semis, their bottom lane was banned all three games by Echo Fox. So if Echo Fox is going to defensively ban around bottom lane like they did against TL, and uh, if Clutch is then going to ban around mid lane, uh, I guess my question, it's a bit of a convoluted question, but where do you think they should be targeting the other team in bans? Like, should they be targeting defensive bans to protect themselves or aggressive bans to try and open up a vulnerability somewhere? As Clutch side? Yeah, so Clutch side. Should they be banning to protect... Or, to, or whatever. to protect Solar, should they be banning to punish Altec and Adrian in some way? Personally, I think with their play style, they should be banning to punish Altec and Adrian. Just right. because, like I said, if you can actually punish bottom lane, uh, you know, if you ban like Tom Kench, things like that, where it, it's really hard to punish bottom lane because, you know, he's just going to eat the AD carry and then mm -hmm. that guy's not going to die, uh, you can actually get so many advantages off bottom lane. So I think it's really beneficial for them to play, you know, same stuff like Thresh, Morgana, 
various, whatever they were playing before that's like lane dominant, has CC, stuff like that, and can set up. And then, you know, just play towards the bottom lane. Right. Also, I agree with that because I think it's easier to target the bottom lane bans. Like, all you have to get out of the meta right now is like Caitlyn and then support bans that you're talking about. Whereas Hooney, like, literally he plays, plays everything. everything. Right. So if he's going to try and play, you know, some big top lane carry, then he's going to find one. And, and to Solo's credit, he's been able to survive against against all these people who are playing carries against him, right? Like, he's yeah. not the flashiest player, but he gets very little help. He, like, loses gracefully, uh, you know, without help, and, and then is able to contribute in the mid game and, yeah. like, find good TVs, find good collapses. I don't think you can ban Solo out right now because his GP's solid. Yeah. And he actually has absorbed a few GP bans. Nari, and then there's play. three big tanks in the meta with Cho'Gath, Ornn, and Sion. So that's mm -hmm. almost too many bans to be able to throw the top lane. Yeah, and I mean, he played Nara in semis as well. He played that all yeah. during the season. So there's, there's a lot of champions that think he can, he can play very comfortably. I do think they should ban Gangplank still versus yeah. just because I feel like that's the one champion where it's like he can just be like a monster like him. It's like the, the champion that never stops scaling. Yeah. So, yeah, I think GP and then going towards the bot lane bans is going to be the best for Especially Clutch. if you're not going to attack him in lane, right? If yeah. you're just going to leave, if you're going to pick a tank top lane and just yeah. leave him on an island, then yeah. he's just like free farming off you, just queuing yeah. every five seconds. So. What do you think about Swain? Should that be red side ban every game? Because it's been getting through a lot. Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, I haven't played like a ton on, you know, competitively on the, the patch where Swain is really broken, but okay. from what I've heard from like other pros and stuff, it's like that champion should not be in the game. Because it's just that broken. Keeps getting through though, yeah, man. What's happening? Through, so. KT Rolster ignored it. And yeah. they won easily. So, it's all. Uh, just uh, <laughs> take a note from KT Rolster. It's, it's hard though, because uh, people say the same thing about like you should never let Feveman get Azir, right? He's yeah. like, never lost on Azir. Uh, Lyra's never lost on Skarner. Like they have these picks that you're like, oh, you're an idiot if you let them have this, but there's too many picks. Yeah. You can't actually ban everything. Yeah. So they're going to get something. You're an idiot right? no matter what. Then. There you go. You're just <laughs> always dumb. That sucks. <laughs> you guys want to do serious predictions now? Sure. For a third place match? Yeah. All right. I will. I'm, I'm not ready. Kobe. <laughs> you already, yeah. You already said you favor Echo Fox. The debate. Yeah. Go for it. I, I think I'm actually a hard favor Echo Fox. Ooh. I think it's going to. I what? think it would be like 3 1 Echo Fox. I think it's tough. Like, because. So I, I feel like the same way, but then every I said time, I wouldn't listen to but then, but then I keep <laughs> I keep doubting Clutch in, in every series, and they they have been showing up quite heavily. Like they were they, a team fight away from finals. Yeah, exactly. And they were really good. At, they took down TSM. Uh, they were team fight away from the finals. I think this actually could be a lot closer, and I, I could actually see Clutch winning it, but I do still favor Echo Fox. Um, I think I'm going to go like 3 2 Echo Fox. Okay. Yeah. But I think it's really close. Yeah, I think it's also going to be really, really close just because I guess my thing is I've seen Clutch kind of hit like a stride, and they're doing really well. And like you said, you know, they're only one team fight away from making finals. Mm -hmm. And for Echo Fox, it's kind of, they've just been like a downhill trend the whole time. So I, I don't really know if I can see Echo Fox winning. Mm -hmm. I think Clutch is going to win 2-1. Ooh, 3-1, too. Yeah, Confidence. I'm with 6A because this is probably the first <laughs> time all season I've predicted Clutch to win a game. Uh, but so Echo Fox wins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Cl the thing with Clutch is uh, the meta hasn't changed in a while. Right, because we've been on 8-5 since the last week of the regular season, and clutches look generally good in all of those games. And if Echo Fox was going to adapt and find a way to make this work for them, I feel like they would have done it by now, right? Yeah. With the two-week break they had before the first playoff series, and after the disappointment, I think, of losing in the semifinals, I don't see them bouncing back in the same way that Clutch would. So on top of the meta, I feel like the mentality should favor Clutch in that way, where Echo Fox had these finals aspirations and now they're super disappointed. Um, I know Darshan has had that quote before, like it's a loser's match for losers and no one wants to be there. <laughs> and then he played there, right? And I feel like Echo, Fox might, there, Echo Fox might have that mindset, whereas even though Clutch is going to be disappointed they didn't make the finals, since they've been talked down on all year mm -hmm. and were almost never expected to even be in this position, I think they're still going to get up for the game. See, I think because it is spring, everyone's looking towards Worlds and they're like, we need to grab our Worlds points. So that's why I feel like mm -hmm. people going into this third place match, like you talked about yours being different because it was summer. Yeah. Um, I, th I think they're actually going to be like pretty and up for I also it. think like, the question I, I guess I would ask is do they actually need to do something different? Can they not just play a standard game and, and be competitive against Clutch, right? And like, I don't think they need to necessarily reinvent the wheel because Echo Fox was a strong team with their, with their solid five. They have been going downhill, but like... I still think that they... they and the can. 20 kill Nocturne. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to show All up right. these days. So 3-1, three, 3-1 one, three, one for Clutch. You said 3-2 Echo Fox, and you said... I said 3-1. He said 3-1 Echo Fox, I said 3-2 Echo Fox. Yeah. All right, split desk. Let's move on to the finals. TL versus 100 Thieves. Neither of these teams have ever been in the finals yep. before. A lot of the players have been in the finals before. Mm -hmm. What are your first thoughts on the series? Uh, I mean, it's going to be hype. Like, I, I think that... 
a lot of people have been looking at the at the bottom lane, and obviously, you know, there was recently the tragedy with Double Lift, and you know, and that is something that is going to be weighing on his mind and a lot of people's minds. But uh, he has asked that we respect his privacy, so we, you know, we wish him all the best, and the fans are supporting him very heavily. But I think the bottom lane is is going to be extremely exciting, right? Like people talked a lot about Double Lift versus Aphromoo. I think that these these guys are bona fide superstars. Double Lift has a chance to win. Uh, you know, a championship with this third team. And and since everyone is looking at the bottom lane, like, I'm super excited to have 6A here uh, because you've played with Afro, you've played against all these guys. Like, I really want to kind of pick your brain. Yeah, I think this match is completely based off bottom lane, like you said, just because both these teams, their play styles, you know, just play hard off bottom. Like, both these teams mm -hmm. are the same, same exact thing. So I think it actually could be, like, a pretty bloody series. You know, when you have two teams doing the same exact strategy, it's going to be a lot of fighting and stuff. It yeah. just comes down to like execution. Because I was gonna say, you're talking about like double lift. It, you know, has been so great all year. But Cody's son was, uh, you know, first team all LCS mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a reason. Like he, he is the the new North American AD carry kind of on the block here. And and him also trying to play like the Caitlyn style and, and go later and and carry in team fights is is I feel like it's gonna set up this really big epic late game team fights that we're going to see from both of these teams like for the most of the series. Yeah, I was doing some pick ban prep on these two teams and while there are some questions that like will find answers, they they are so similar as you said, like top lane both these guys hard prioritize the three main tanks, jungle, maybe you could say TL has a higher priority on Trundle and Olaf is switched, but they really function very similar in game and then Talia would be like a small thing that 100 Thieves picks more than TL. Uh, so it does come down to the bottom lane, and that's why I want to ask you, who do you think actually has the edge in the bottom lane if the other parts of the map are relatively equal? Is it Afro and Cody Sun, or is it Double and Ole this year? I definitely think it's Afro and Cody Sun, just because playing versus Double and Ole, even now, like, solely in the season, they still feel a bit off. They don't feel like they're, you know, super, like, together. Mm -hmm. So I think Afro and Cody have done, like, a really good job of, I guess, being a duo. So. Okay. You are a little bit biased, though, because you play with I mean, so just, little, <laughs> I did, just to follow up on that as well, though, because I agree with you uh, in the fact that Cody Sun and Afro have looked more on the same page for most of the season, but during the playoffs, uh, Double If currently has, if he's to keep it up, like the KDA record for the playoffs. He's a 39 KDA in playoffs. Yeah, he has like over 30 kills. He's died two times. Uh, is it working better in playoffs, or do you feel like they're still just disjointed and he's picking up the kills in team fights? I, I do think it's the latter. I think okay. that there still has to be a little more time to kind of prove that, you know, they are like that duo. And I, I still think it's a little disjointed just from playing against them. It's kind of interesting. So I'd be curious to hear, like, you know, we, you talked about how you think that they both play very similarly. Like, they're both such a heavy focus on bottom lane. But to me, Team Liquid is a team that plays, like, so much more quickly. Like, 100 mm -hmm. Thieves is a very slow team. They're, like, very measured. It feels like they have extreme confidence in their late game and kind of play this slower style because of it. Like they were very similar to Clutch and I felt like that was more stylistically similar. So do you think that like they do play the same or it's just more like where their focus on the map is? I would just say it's their focus on the map. And I think uh, 100 Thieves naturally will you know come towards bottom lane. Similar to how like CLG with Afro in the past always came towards the bottom lane. It's just because Afro is very vocal yeah. and he always you know communicates his option and how to do it and stuff like that. So. He does it in a way that's very, I guess, easy to execute. And so it just naturally draws the jungler and teammates stuff down there. Um, for 100 Thieves, you know, I don't really know who like their vocal point is. But yeah, I think it'll just depend on whatever team plays the map better. I don't think that's going to be because, like, you know, Ole and Double Lift are better 2 2 or Afro and Cody are better 2 2. I don't think it's going to be like that at all. Mm -hmm. I actually think it comes down to just execution and how both of the teams play with their bot lanes. Kobe? Uh, this is not going to be about the series, but for you bringing up Afro points and talking about how he is in team comps and stuff, and especially with how CLG kind of struggled with, uh, you know, communication and stuff during the beginning of the season, were you guys able to isolate what, you know, you were missing after Afro left or uh, a lot of the big things? Because there was so yeah. much talk from Zix, uh, you know, from Biofrost about you guys working on this communication system and trying mm -hmm. out different things, and uh, there were a lot of switches. What, what was the Afro effect that you were missing? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I, I want to say like the, the hype, I guess, for us was like warranted because I mean, we were like pretty insane at the beginning. Uh -huh. and then after that, you know, stuff went downhill, other teams started getting better and you just naturally start doing worse. But as for Afro, I mean, I, I've had countless nights where I'm up till 1 a.m., 2 a.m., just like watching old VODs from months ago, just trying to listen to everything he's saying, like, you know, what, 
how can I implement this? How, how can we do this better? And it's just a lot of small things. And I think what Afro does really good is he gets everyone on the same page, and he like hones in people who are like off on their own mission or something. He kind of like you know brings them back in on the plan. Awesome. Do you, we were asking you before the show if you have like an uplifting Afro story <laughs> in a clutch situation. Do, do you have anything like before? Mentality. Whenever I look at Afro Moo, uh, coming up to MSI or walking out on stage, he has a swagger and a sense of calm about him. Mm. Uh, could you talk about maybe the effects that has on the rest of the team coming in, or is it all just kind of people being in their own head and looking forward? So I don't think, I think it's like, you know, everyone's focused in their own mindset, whatever they can do to, you know, play their best. But Afro does have like the, He's not like the super talkative person, you know, making sure everyone's okay before the game. Mm -hmm. He's just like the the nonverbal kind of leader, where it's like you just you just watch him walk in front of you, and you're like, wow, that guy's confident. Like, <laughs> he's we're gonna so win. cool. Yeah, like this guy is so cool. <laughs> we're gonna win today. So, right. I don't know. He just has that kind of like aura around. I, yeah. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking it really about. Really makes though. you want to ask him if you'll sign your mouse pad. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Talking about some other parts of the matchup, though, <laughs> now that we've established that Aphromoo is a cool cat. <laughs> the, the arm sleeve? Have you seen the arm sleeve? <laughs> I mean, they, they came into the um, the airport line, like right yeah. next to us, the, the airplane, and like they, the whole team came up. And it was like the same thing. Like, Afro had like, uh, you know, some earbuds in or whatever. So I was like nervous to like say something. But I was like talking to Medios the whole time. And I was like, what should I say to Aphromoo? Ah, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> yeah. I liked how... Uh, I hope I don't blow their cover, but oh. I, I like how... <laughs> you might be blowing their cover on it's, this. It's over. Okay. Uh, some of the, some people on 100 Thieves are memeing about TSM. They're like, oh, are we on TSM's flight? And for like half a second, it's like, is TSM on this flight? Because I'm just so used to them being <laughs> in the finals of third place. Yeah, walking through the airport, they're always yeah. like, oh, is that TSM? Is that TSM? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it was not. No, it's not TSM. Yeah. And then uh, you asked uh, where Medios' seat was. He's like, what, what seat are you? 27. Yeah, he's, he's like, like oh, I'm right beside you. Yeah, what seat? 19. Yeah, yeah. it's like right, right next to you. It's 10 seats yeah. away. Uh, they definitely have that like sense of calm about them. But the rest of the map, like, I do think it matters a lot. For 100 Thieves, Ryu and Someday for a lot of the season to me were big weak points, but they've strengthened up a lot mm -hmm. uh, in this next round. And if there is a place to target, I'm really curious uh, what type of mid lane bans we do see against Ryu. Because more so than anyone else, his champion picks were targeted to Rise and Talia. And like yeah. everything else, he almost never played. So do you guys think that's a viable strategy to just try and take those two away? Or, because Pobelter is also good on those champions and they play a similar style, do they just look to outplay him anyway? I mean, I, I think that like things like Swain are just higher priority, so like you can maybe ban one away. I don't know if you can spend both your bans on, on that, right? Like, yeah. uh, Talia was, was focused pretty heavily in bans, and I think that makes sense because its roaming is just like so damn good. Um, but I think there's a number of champions that you can play that are kind of in that same category, you know, like Rise. I think LeBlanc can kind of fit in the same category as well, where you can kind of get out and roam, but like... I just think that uh, Swain is, is, is like too good to leave up. For I think Swain should be red side banned yeah. uh, most games this series. Kobe? Yeah, I, def I definitely agree. Even though like there are cases where you know teams have ignored it or teams let it through and play around it, like you can try and get something like the Talia, try and roam around and make plays. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where it's more difficult, right? Yeah. It's the same thing that we were talking about before where why don't you just play front line to back and have like Caitlyn back line DPS and like have a bunch of tanks in front? Um, I mean, you can, or you can try and play split pushers, and it's That's with hard. Kha'Zix, and then pick people off, but it's just more risky. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You know, like I said, I don't know a whole ton about the Swain thing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with you guys and say it. Yeah, he was nodding Let's the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this. You're smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we think there, there's a lot of uh, equal matchups. Then, how do you actually predict the series? And we can kind of use that as a way to show where you mm. think teams are stronger or weaker. Six A. You have to start this one because you. Uh, I already know Six A's prediction. Time. I want to. Three O hundred thieves. Three O. It's free. Don't even try. We'll do. We'll do. Um, I'm gonna say three one, three two, three hundred two hundred thieves. Yeah. Okay. Why though? I mean, they just because play. of the bottom line advantage. No. Um. I just think hundred thieves. Like, if you look at their gameplay in the first half of the split, is kind of like, okay, this team is exactly what we expected, mm -hmm. and then they hit like. A random like kind of like peak or stride, yeah. and they just started winning so many games. And I think they've kind of like followed that going to playoffs. Uh, you can see in their last playoffs match versus Clutch is super close, but you know Hundred Thieves is still playing really well. And you know I just have trust in them to keep improving and be good enough for the finals. Yeah, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, for a lot of the year, it looked like Team Liquid wasn't going to be able to put it together. 
uh, for me. Like they started off super hot, winning games in 30 minutes, and then it actually seemed like they didn't have a mid game or a late game and that they mm -hmm. were completely lost. Uh, but in this patch where impact looks solid in every game and then it is heavily about late game hyper carries, that works for them. But the thing that impresses me is how good they have been in the mid game. They've come from behind multiple times now, 7,000 gold down against Cloud9, who was a good macro team for most of the year, beat them, uh, and even against Echo Fox, had a lot of close games in the mid-game and were still able to win, and that's where 100 Thieves excels as well. So that's what makes this a really difficult series for me to predict. Um, but I feel like TL has more momentum coming through to the finals, uh, and I'm actually trusting their mid and late game enough to say that they'd be the favorites in this series, like 3-1 or 3-2, and I'll just say 3-1. Yeah, I, I also think that Team Liquid are the favorites. Um, the impact point is a really big one for me because a lot during the regular season, especially when the meta was changing, um, I I didn't feel like I got a lot of consistency from impact. Um, you know, everyone was bringing up, oh yeah, he had the biggest offseason contract and all this stuff was going around. Um, but in the playoffs and at Worlds and stuff, you know, international competitions, I feel like when the pressure is on, Impact it becomes extremely consistent, and this is mm -hmm. the perfect meta for him with the tanks. Um, so I feel like it's just a really good meta for the way that they want to play. They want to have double lift, you know, on this carry. They want to play around bottom lane, have impact on a tank up top side. They've been even publicly vocal about, yeah, go ahead and gank my top laner. Yeah. I don't care. And they make the choice of like they see the jungler going top, and they're like, impact. I'll play that two v one. We're gonna go <laughs> bottom side, and then they do it. So I, I just feel like it's. Again, to, to the meta point that you mm -hmm. uh, you know, keep on bringing up, it has it's not changing here. Right. For um, finals, I feel like it's still going to be the same, and I would give the slight edge to Team Liquid. I do think it's going to be uh, definitely a close one now, so I think I have to give it the three-two game score just to show how <laughs> close. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's hard, it's hard for me because Teal has looked so good in playoffs, and like you said, Hundred Thieves was nuts down the stretch. They were nine and one in their last ten, I yeah. think, including tiebreakers. Yeah, pretty so, insane. Like, they were pretty insane. I think. The Clutch series made people, I think, maybe lose some confidence because uh, people still saw Clutch as that weaker team and it went five games. Um, but it's, it's hard sometimes to decipher, like, what is because an opponent is playing well and what is because an opponent is playing poorly, right? Like, did it go five games because Clutch played really well? Like, did TL come back from 7K down because, because they played really well or did C9 play poorly, right? And, like, when I looked at the TL-C9 series, I felt it was mostly, like, C9 didn't know how to play with the lead. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you give that lead to 100 Thieves, I could definitely see them closing out those games. Um, so where are you going? I don't know, man. It's really hard. I, I, I'm I'm that feeling sounded more thieves. Right? Sounded a little hundred thieves favorite. I'm feeling more hundred thieves favorite. Yeah. I think because uh, one of the things that has actually really impressed me is also Medios. And Medios is a guy who like doesn't really get talked about a ton. Um, but I think Medios has actually been insanely consistent. When I look at the top lane, you talk about consistency from Impact, but I also think second half of the split and in playoffs, you know, someday has been very very consistent as well. Like I think that their bottom lane is really strong. I think it's an incredibly even series like across the board. Uh, but I, but I think I have to go 3-2 three, three, two. Two. Yeah, three, two <laughs> for, for 100 Thieves. All right, double 3-2, 100 Thieves. You say 3-1, TL? I said 3-2. Ah, I'm the only 3-1. Yeah. TL. Good job. I like, though, that we split all of the predictions, like right down the middle. That actually almost never happens for mm -hmm. us. We're usually one-sided. We needed a fourth man. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I want to add on my point, actually, to TL. So, like, I, I think it was their quarterfinal match for C9. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if you look at that match, they were down... Seven game, you know, game one. Yeah, they were, they were down so much gold every single game, but then... Like you said, they yeah. have this like this magic where they just win a team fight at some point, and then they start coming back. Mm -hmm. So, but that that is why you know my prediction of three two honey thieves is still there, just because I think that TL plays really slow early, and honey thieves plays a little faster. So they're okay. just naturally going to get a lead. And uh, you know, if TL isn't able to get like that winning team fight, then I think they'll lose. So. Speaking of the quarterfinals, though, I'm curious to get your opinion. Like, did you feel like that was TL magic, or was that C9 didn't know what to do with the lead? Because they were 7k up in game one, they were like 4k up pretty early in game two. Both games, it felt like they just kind of didn't extend the lead. Like, was that, damn, TL just knows how to stop this so well, or is it C9, you don't know how to close? I definitely think, like, in this, you know, day and age of league, where it's like, if you get a lead, it's pretty simple, easy to close out a game. Mm -hmm. So I think that was just more so C9 not, you know, knowing how to play their comp very well, or their comps very well. Um, but I mean, I also think that you know, Doublelift in general has this kind of like he he's always like a, he's not ever a non-factor. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I remember, if you guys remember the TSM Immortals game where they were down 10k gold, yeah, and then they won one team fight, and then they just ended the game. And it's just like I feel like Doublelift always kind of like has that like in his back pocket where 
he can just like you know pop up at any moment and they can just win. So. All right, going to be looking forward to those games as well. It's time to bring on our final guest, though. We have Rick Fox, the founder of Echo Fox, also participating in the third, fourth place match. Give him a round of applause. Well. Sure. Awesome, Rick. Thanks, man. Thanks. Hey, guys. Yeah, thank I like you. the style too. Oh, you like it? Uh, yeah, he's got his own championship. Yankee life. Echo Fox collab. Yeah, this is the latest. Uh, I thought I'd try it out for the show. This awesome, pretty sick. <laughs> uh, we were just talking about you the third place match in finals. So <laughs> they had to compensate. We yeah, had to what's going on? on? <laughs> yeah, NBA players. <laughs> <kind of thing. laughs> You have enough confidence you can sit, yes. sit in the short chair. Real quick though, we were just talking about uh, the third, fourth place match. I won't make you predict that one because you're going to go for Echo, Echo Fox. Do you have a yeah. finals prediction between TL and Hunter Thieves? I think it's going to be a lot closer than uh, our match with TL, uh, for sure. I think the history there, especially in the bot lane, is mm -hmm. well noted. Uh, so that could be a wash. Right. Uh, I think TL is playing up to the level with which I think everyone expected them to play the entire uh, spring split. Uh, so if I was to select uh, a team, I think with the experience, I would mm -hmm. go with TL. All right. It's going to be interesting. Uh, and all of our, I'm sure all of our thoughts are with, with Double Lift uh, to see how he handles the emotions of, of the week leading into that. But I know I think he's here to play. Yep. And mm -hmm. so I'm wishing him well. Absolutely. Also, he's on the TL side of All the right. panel. We both predicted okay. TL. Right, they they both predicted Hunter Thieves. So that's <laughs> perfect high for us. Well, he's six a has a bias. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that <was like> that's <laughs> without bias. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you uh, quickly about Echo Fox this split as well because you've been uh, an owner in the league for some time, and this was by far like Echo Fox's best split. Yeah. I, I was kind of wanted to ask you. <laughs> to say the least, but definitely the good is the feeling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what have you learned, really, as an owner in the three years you've spent in the LCS that kind of allowed you to find more success this way? Uh, I, I think I would start with uh, just continual growth as an organization would probably be the first uh, uh, thing I would point to, uh, an understanding of how to lose, <laughs> doing everything uh, differently. Uh, but I have to give credit where credit is due, and that is through... Um, you know, the addition of the front office staff uh, in Jared Jeffries. Uh, also, you know, Jake Fife, who's been there from the day I knocked on the door when we bought Gravity. Uh, mm -hmm. His growth as a, as a general manager in our organization. And then we did probably one of the most difficult things to do in professional sports uh, is to part ways with people that you're, you've, you've grown with and have been yeah. most uh, attached to emotionally. And some of the players that are dear to my heart are no longer with our organization. Uh, and that was a hard thing to do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was a, um, it has been for the better in the record column. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are still young Echo Fox uh, pros now that are new to our organization that are still finding their way in our culture. Uh, but they've also brought a new culture to us, which is a culture of winning, which I think, <laughs> which I think we're okay with. <laughs> yeah. Who in the organization came up with the idea for the big giant heads that you bring to the LCS? Because that has been my favorite part. Um, I actually have uh, those uh, for my birthday on uh, this past year. Uh, they, the, or the organization actually made some big heads of, of me. Uh -huh. uh, and they all came in and they into my office on my birthday and they proceeded to do impersonations of me. <laughs> with the big head. Uh, and so as the season started, there was a lot of talk about whether or not our egos as, a, as individuals would be able to withstand coming together. And, and, and it was, a, I think it was a, an accurate assessment or question mm -hmm. at the time because mm -hmm. I've been on championship, uh, I shouldn't say championship level teams, I've been on teams that were projected to win championships that fell apart because of the egos. Uh, and we had four, four Hall of Famers on our team at one point that yep. just... You know, it was a disaster. So to to bring together talent doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a great team result, right? Uh, and, and on paper, we looked pretty talented. So we knew we had to solve our talent problem, which we did, but we didn't know how that cohesion would work uh, throughout the spring split. So we were just as anxious to find that out as you guys were. Mm -hmm. um, and so the thought then, uh, as I said one day, is uh, the, the bigger we get as an org, the bigger our heads will get. 
Uh, and, and the challenge is how do you keep that in check, right? That's the cardboard face. And that's the cardboard head. <laughs> so, so, you know, so it was the, the subtlety in that was, you know, as you're out on stage and you're competing on the rift and, and you're having those, the throws of the, all the emotions, you look out in the stand, you see your big head. You remember, you know, keep your head. Like, don't, don't lose control of what we're doing here. That was a lot deeper answer to the big head question that I thought I was going to get. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that, that was the intent, I guess, from my thought with it. Yeah. Is, you, know. you know, it's really interesting, you know, hearing you speak about, you know, kind of some of the egos coming in and some of the things that you've dealt with in sport. You know, there was a lot of talk about, oh, will this team gel? And it was on, on paper very talented, as you said. Uh, did the fact that you have worked with some of these, like some egos before in pro sports or, and, and had dealt with these sort of situations give you more confidence uh, that you could learn from some of the mistakes that those teams had made and really make that work in the LCS? I think that's a fair assessment, yes. Uh, I, I think what we uh, were maybe less fearful of uh, going that route and taking the, what appears to be a bigger risk than maybe need be. But you gotta remember again, we were Echo Fox, right? And which, what you knew of Echo Fox was still yet to be really defined as a, a successful organization in League of Legends. Uh, so we wanted to take uh, a chance on players we believe from a skill standpoint and a talent standpoint was already in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, no different the sport out there in the ecosystem, whether it's basketball or football, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, I had a coach once tell me, a, a great coach, told me the ingredients to go into it are your talent, your attitude, and your skill level with the re repetition you put behind your skill. And I, I just thought that the attitude for a lot of young LCS players is growing. They're going through the ups and downs of finding their way as, uh, as being a pro. It's easy. I'd say it's easy to be a pro. It's not easy to be a professional. And when you're a professional, those are the players like Stix A and guys you've seen that are, you know, made a career for themselves. Yeah. That are making a career for themselves. They understand how to, how to be coachable, how to understand uh, the stresses of the criticism that come on Reddit or, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the highs and the loss of wins and, and, and successes, how to deal with teammates, how to be a teammate. All of those things make you a professional. Uh, uh, and because it, it's easy to become a pro, but the professionals right. stick. They stick beyond a tryout. They stick beyond, you know, uh, a split. You know, they last. And so I just had a belief that I'd seen enough from from the, the, the current crew uh, of, of talent and players that are with us that I, I knew that they they had a willing attitude to win, yeah. and that their frustrations along the way of falling short kind of spilled out into competition amongst their teammates, amongst yeah. their organizations. And they just needed to understand that it, it isn't always graceful, doesn't always end up looking pretty, mm -hmm. uh, but there's more value in, in, in building uh, cohesion as opposed to tearing it apart. Yeah, and I want to follow up on that as well because the backgrounds of these players when the roster is put together, a lot of people are saying it's either going to be amazing or it's going to be a tragedy, like everyone's just going to fall apart. Right. And it felt like that was a rallying cry for the team for most of the, for the first half of the split, right? They're just like, oh yeah, everyone was saying we're going to be toxic and we can't be too close to each other. And they were memeing about it and it was actually bringing them together, yes. right? And really driving their growth. But then the second half of the split wasn't as good. They were three and six. They had the buy in the semifinals. They now dropped down to the third place match. How do they make that bounce back? And almost kind of like, what is the culture like right now since they did prove people wrong only to then have the fall? Right. I, I would uh, blame CLG for that at first because they <laughs> stole our mojo in the second half of the season. <laughs> uh, but you're right. It's a good uh, thing to separate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, no, what, what, what transpired is exactly what you said. Uh, the, the outward criticism kind of really made our job easier inside, internally because it was everyone out there in the world against us, right? So then you only have, what you have is each other. And so mm -hmm. we were able to build that. And then as you know, in League of Legends, the meta will shift and 8.4 came around. And I was like, what's wrong with 8.3? 8, 8 8.3 looked pretty good to me. <laughs> but, you know, we, were like, we were doing really good in that one. But that's a part of being a professional, handling the adjustments and the shifts that come to your season. And we got, we got blitzed and uh, we got you know, humbled uh, we had to deal with some adversity, and we stuck together. Now, what comes with all of those shifts in a, and ebbs and flow in a season comes the confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Your confidence can get blasted a little bit when you don't, when you're not on a, a win streak like you were originally. Uh, but in those moments come the opportunities for improvement. 
This is a year-long run where we hope to be representing and fighting for a championship in the world, right? The mm-hmm. split here in NA is very important to us. We've done things this split we haven't ever done in an organization. We made the playoffs. That wasn't our goal. Our goal is to win the split, but we made the playoffs. We're now playing for third place, which is not which is champion points, riff rivals. All this stuff has great value, but more importantly, we get to see ourselves now again on stage here in Miami where we're competing on the road, not at home in, in Santa, Santa Monica. We're competing on the road. How do we handle traveling? How do we handle, again, a, a, a bigger audience? Some of our players got to experience for the first time on stage what it meant to play on the LCS stage, some of our academy players. They had bright moments, but then they also came away realizing it's different when you're playing with people in the stands that are actually there to cheer, to cheer you on or to boo you. And all of that brings up all the emotions. So. Mm-hmm. We get another chance to, to compete and uh, finish the, the spring split off on a high. It's not as high as we could, but it gives us something to look forward to in the summer. What that looks like going into the summer, mm-hmm. I think, I, and I said this to someone the other day, you know, I said, look, I think a lot of teams that we are accustomed to seeing here today, the TSMs, CLGs, the C9s, are not here. And that is like mind-blowing to me, knowing the LCS and the LCS. Mm-hmm. And so Andy, Jack, uh, the, the uh, MSG group now, they are not going to sit on their hands, right? They're going to come back stronger and better for the summer split. And so we can't stay <laughs> at the level we're at. We have to get better. And that's what makes, I think, this great. Everyone's going to get better. So as, as an owner, and obviously you're a fan, we see you in the stands all the time. Like, how do you deal with, with watching the games and seeing things that you're, you're perceiving to be going wrong? Like, if you disagree with, say, what the coach thinks or what the players <laughs> think, like, because you're, you're a fan, but you're also someone in a position of power. So, like, how is that dynamic for you when you aren't necessarily the one who gets to make the, the day-to-day decisions in the game, but you see something, you're like, oh, that's not right. <laughs> I go, I, I have these feelings that come over me yeah. uh, uh, during pick ban or during a game. And the difference in, you asked me, how do we reach a, a higher level of success in Echo Fox this, this split? Mm-hmm. A lot of this has, has been because I've removed myself. <laughs> Uh, I've uh, I've only been a player for so many years in my life, right? And now I'm an owner, and and in that ownership capacity, the same intensity and and desire to win and compete, and uh, it's something I have not really learned how to harness as an owner yet. It just kind of pours out of me, and and I don't want our players or our coaching staff or our general managers to ever be looking over their shoulder, worried about my opinion. I play the game. I, I love the game. I, I understand the game today on a whole other level than I did three years ago, right? But it doesn't mean I'm the most qualified to be commenting on pick band or asking mm-hmm. questions and I having. Swain looks having, strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I, I listen to the dive, okay? When you guys are breaking, I'm, I'm looking for the edge when you guys are breaking down the patches. I'm going, okay, yeah, but hold on now. These guys said this, you know? Like, so I, I've, I really have stayed out of, of the, like, the minutiae. I'm there. Like I, I, I go and watch. I'll, I'll pop in and Next watch scrims. Yeah. I'll pop in and yeah. you know I'm at the game. But I, I don't. I no longer sprint into the locker room after we win or lose. For you know, with ten questions, I no mm-hmm. longer. I no longer corner Jake Fife in the hallway in <laughs> <and, and> Santa <laughs> Monica, wanting to know what's going. You know, I'm no, I, so I've, I've really, um, I think, harnessed some of that energy and. Pulled it back a little. That's bit. a hard thing for a lot of the owners. <laughs> yeah, to do. yeah, yeah. And as you said, um, because it's getting more competitive, and we can only have one winner. There's going to be nine disappointed uh, owners yeah. that are all looking, you know. To yeah. And and uh, six of them are probably are, are more disappointed right now than the four that are here. But I tell you, that's pure fire and motivation for them. Mm-hmm. That's really fire and motivation. Uh, I, I, you get to the, if you get to these moments, you don't, you never want to not be here again. You know, I don't want to miss, you know, <laughs> the, the summer split. I don't want to miss the playoffs. I, I want to go to Worlds for the first time mm-hmm. as an organization. These are all things. So these moments like this are like my, I can see, I can see the goosebumps in my arm already. They get me, they, they fuel me and they fuel our organization. So guys that have won championships already in ALCS or been to the Worlds, Believe me, they want to go back just as much as I want to get there for the first time. Yeah, and I guess this is actually a question for you and Stixay about the level of competition this split. COG had never missed the playoffs before. TSM had been in every single finals. Yeah. The four teams that were in semifinals had also never been to finals. So there was a lot of new stuff yeah. this year. How did the level of competition change 
this year compared to years past where we're seeing all these new faces at the forefront now? I, you know what, I think the opportunity for, for players in free agency, some of the, like look at Afromoot, someone that, you know, you played exceptionally well with at CLG. So, you know, him making a shift in free agency, some of the other players moving to new teams, mm -hmm. getting an opportunity to grow their career maybe uh, in a different capacity, whether it's leadership, whether it's in, you know, uh, financial improvement and in, in, in their free agent status. All of that gave teams like 100 Thieves, uh, teams like us, mm -hmm. opportunity to get players. Uh, and it is, it's all, guys, it's all about the players. It, it's their talent. They are their talent that makes this go, right? And so at any point in time, they have an opportunity to shift. They're going to shift the ecosystem. They're going to, and, and they have to go where they want to go, right? They want to have to play for whoever they want to play for. And when those things happen, you have the new teams like, you know, the Golden Guardians and Optic come into the uh, ecosystem. The only advantage I feel we had is that and it reminds me, two years ago when I first came in, if it wasn't for Jack and Andy and Steve and, and, and Gerard, if it wasn't for those guys really kind of like grabbing me and sitting me down and saying, hey, look, we're here for you. But when things kick off, we want to kick your butt. But we're here for you now. Like we're owners, we want all this to work. But I watched them. Like I watched how they did as much as they would let me see into their world. But when the split started... I didn't get the same access, and I had to kind of like, you know, swim in the deep water, right? And I had to survive. Um, but now I can swim in the deep water. We can swim in the deep water, but at the same time, what 100, Thie what 100 Thieves have done is, is extremely impressive. We know how difficult it is to step into this, and all of a sudden, so Nate shot, like, kudos to him. I mean, what Clutch Gaming has done, uh, Daryl Morley and Mor uh, the Houston Rocket guys, I mean, that's impressive. But I think a lot of that is on the back of the talent. That they've been able to, you know, really convince to come and be a part of their organization uh, and, and jumpstart something special for them. So uh, that to me uh, is, is where it's all at. We, we, got, we got some great players that really changed the fortune of Echo Fox. And I think there's some great teams that are used to being up there. They're going to make some tough decisions maybe in the coming mm -hmm. weeks, months maybe. And we're going to see a lot of different looks. Uh, and we're going to have to make our own decisions as well. I like it, teasing the roster changes yeah. too. Yeah. Any <laughs> thoughts on the competition this split? Uh, I just think from like the player side of things that, uh, you know, you kind of, with all these like new organizations and franchising and all this, it's like, this is when players are, you know, everything's a lot more stable, there's no relegations. So it's mm -hmm. just like, you know, players are gonna weigh their options and try different, this is like the time to try new things. And that's what a lot of players did. And I think, you know, for like the new orgs like Clutch and Honey Thieves, you know, if they have players who really buy into like their vision and really see like what they want to do, and they you know kind of collab, like you can have really good teams like Hundred Thieves in the finals now. So, I'm kind of curious. So, like, I come from a pro gaming background, but obviously it's, it's so different. Like in those days, we essentially like chose our own teams, and then mm -hmm. you know you did well as that team, you get signed to a roster, mm -hmm. you're signed to an org, right? Like mm -hmm. these days, it's so much different. So I'm kind of curious, like how it feels for you. Like, yeah, you played with Afro for a long time. Now Afro's gone. You're playing with Biofrost. Like not being in control necessarily of the roster changes of where people are coming and going like how do you find it with those changes and how do you find uh, like how hard is it to, to kind of gel with new players when they come and, and say goodbye to like friends when they leave yeah it's it's pretty uh, difficult I would say um, you know typically towards like you know the end of like a player's contract it's usually you know the, the players on the team are kind of talking to everyone like hey you know what are you doing next split and stuff and then you know the next day it, it happened it's like Oh, I'll see you, man. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how it is. And same for like, uh, I forgot the other part of your question. Just, well. just how is it with like new t new personalities coming in and stuff, like trying to make it work not only, you know, like on the ref as a team, but also you, you oh, right, right. guys, you okay. hang out with these guys. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, like I said, it's, it's pretty much just like, you know, a day it's done. Like, you know, you have this new guy on your team. Oh, welcome. Yeah, or something yeah. like that. It, it's very like, I guess like black and white. It's not like, you know, like there's this whole introduction, like, Trials and all stuff. It's just kind of like just one day. This guy's on my team. One next day, he's not. So. Matchmaking. There you go. Yeah. Now, now this person is on your team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You that that happened to me my rookie year. Yeah. It happened to me my first year in the, in, in, in the NBA with the Celtics. I had a, a uh, Brian Shaw. I ended up winning mm -hmm. championships with him, championships in LA with him later. But within the first month, I developed this great you know friendship with this new player. He, I was his rookie, and he was taking me on his wing. And he literally, we had dinner one night after a game. He was driving down the, the Mass Pike, heading back to his house, and I was driving behind him. And at the toll booth, he got a call, and he got traded to the Miami Heat down here. And by the time I went to practice the next morning, he wasn't there. And you know, and that's those that's the business of sport, uh, which is ever changing. And I think for for a lot of the players in, in league 
are discovering and understanding that um, it doesn't mean they don't have value, though. It doesn't mean that their careers end there. Those relationships that, that, that they create, I'm sure you have a close relationship with Afrimu, those things may join up somewhere else down the road. Again, something I played and won championships with Brian Shaw 10 years later. I hope you have a 10-year, 20-year career. Like, but that, those things happen. So uh, it is a little jarring sometimes you know, when you have that close, because there's a comfort in it, right? There's a shorthand, which took you guys maybe nine games to find, right, for this new split, this new group of guys. Uh, uh, but that's just a part of the business. Yeah, and how close would you say the esports league player movement is to that? Because I've heard some interview bites from Dardock who said like he really wanted to play with Phoenix, mm -hmm. and that was part of the Echo Fox yeah. roster construction. How much, how much player input would you and Jared take building the Echo Fox team versus a general manager in the NBA who seems a little bit more removed from the player input? Yeah, no, uh, uh, Jared and uh, Jake. Uh, the, the, the coaching staff, Nick, uh, we were in the we were in the bunker in the you know in the trenches figuring this out in the off season, and so much of it was as you're built, as you're building a team, you're trying to create that synergy of who wants to play with who because you have to be clear on you know LCS players are very clear they're so knowledgeable about their the the players with which they played against, played mm -hmm. with, or aspire to play with, um, and they voice that and they're very clear about it. Yeah, uh, and I, I remember. It, kind of giving Jared an education on entering the space and he comes from you know front office NBA like a great experience in pro sports but I said look here are the things that are going to matter to the players they want to know who they're playing with they want to know who the coach is they, they, it's very clear we can't mask in the standings how we've done the last four splits because it's very <laughs> clear so they're going to see us as a, a not a winning organization yet and then they're going to also want to know what's the living environment like, right? What is there, what's the practice facility like? Where are they going to be staying? And those are all things that they care about. And I said, those are things that some we can answer clearly, things, others we can't. Like when, when we, we literally are still stuck in that place of having to build an organization around a core group of one or two players who really are willing to trust us with their careers. It's hard to leave a team sometimes because you know what you have, right? You can trust. That organization, I bet it's been hard for Africa to leave because you you, ha you know what you have, right? And and so when you're trying to build something, you have to convince Nate. Nate Shot had to convince Africa to leave. He had to convince that what he was building was going to be as valuable and and and, and emulate uh, what Africa was known before, or what he may think needs to happen. And so, great opportunity for players. Players have a lot of power in their careers when they really truly understand the power they have. Right now, they have to handle their business in game and out of game. But when they're doing that at the highest level, they actually call the shots. They actually call the shots. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how it goes. I'm kind of curious for you guys. So, you know, a lot of people, uh, I, I think, talk about, you know, the friendships they had with ex-teammates and, and things like this. And mm -hmm. for me, when I, when I was playing, I always like, so it wasn't that I wasn't friends with them, but if I played against a former teammate, there was no one I wanted to beat more. So I'm kind of curious, yeah. like, was it like that for, for you guys? Yeah, it doesn't have to mean that you don't like Afro, but mm -hmm. like when you play against Afro, do you want to smash him? Yeah, I remember the first uh, 100 Thieves match. I think it was our <laughs> first game of the split or second game of the split. And I remember I was trying like so hard. Like, I, I wanted to win so badly. I was like, Blast him. God, I felt like I was clicking like twice as much as I normally do. I was <laughs> going off, but you know, we didn't win, but. I know what you're about, the yeah. competition. Yeah, it's that way. Um, for me, it was more wanting, you know, wanting to beat the organization uh, than the players that I was close to on the team. Yeah. Uh, definitely wanting to uh, have the bragging rights of the win at the end of it. We saw it with Uni and Rainover uh, when we matched up with them. I think it was, might have been our, one of our first losses. Uh, he wanted it so badly against you guys, and you guys knocked us off. <laughs> our, you know, knocked us off our. our, our, our our first top loss standing the there, yeah, first loss of the split, and but that's that's what makes rivalries and competition so good. Look, I, this all started for me with a relationship with CLG, and so every time we play CLG, it means something different to me and my son than it does any other team. And it means a lot to us as well. Like as uh, you know, the teams get older and more of the older players stick around, we get more of these cross team yeah. rivalries and stuff that start to build. But one of the most important things that we've seen is. The teams that can find new talent, um, that, that's like an extremely valuable resource. Like right. the licorice pickup for Cloud9. Yeah. Um, like people have kind of gotten to the space where they feel like North American talent like is just a desert and there, there's nothing here. Like you have to import all these things. But your team has actually 
a long for many years or a lot of the time that you've been in the league had this 10 man roster strategy you know and you like you said you gave a lot of your roster um you know stage time in the lcs as far as the academy mm -hmm. team do you put more effort into that what what's kind of the focus for the organization around building and finding new talent trying to get those diamonds yeah that's that's huge uh you know the question of you know when will na win the wor when win worlds uh you know we have a belief that you you can win with na talent like we just the, the NA talent is just developing. It's it's developing and it's growing, and uh, we want to be on the forefront of that. We I, I love what FlyQuest is doing. With their you know they're diving into the college scene. You know, you, it's out there. The talent is out there, and and we've discovered it through really our the commitment of our staff. Jake, we got Nick. a challenger player in the we, crowd. We, we have yeah, out there. Is, uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love it. I love it. You guys are in the right. You're in your world, right? This is your arena. This is your atmosphere, and you're putting yourself. <laughs> In this environment, on a, on a bait, on and that's I commend that. Um, I I think that it's it's going to happen. I I I 100 believe it. We had an academy team that worked its way to the finals and lost uh, literally in the fifth game. We we're so proud close of them. Years. It was close as ever. I mean, I thought there was a sliver left on the nexus, but um, it didn't <laughs> yeah. go that way. But in that odd orange and and uh, and Papa Chow and Demonte, who's been with us now for two years, is you know he's grown and and. And it, that brings me to the mentorship of it all, right? Um, he was mentored by Froggen, but he's an NA player, right? And I know there's a future for Froggen if he chose and wanted to be a part of, of a team again in the NA or somewhere in, in League of Legends. He's sitting there ready to go. I, I, I know he is, but he has trained DeMonte to the point where DeMonte has the confidence to step out there. And I don't see any of our players as NA or, or, or imports or whatever. I see them as players. We want the best team on the floor, but... I don't think it'll be long before you look out and you'll see NA players in Europe and in Korea, and it, it's going to happen. Right. Yeah, I think you'll be happy to hear Froggen actually announce that he's uh, signing with Origin. So he's going to be Did signing he? with an EU team. I think that just got announced today. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. This is normally the point. Good stuff. Normally, point in the show where we do Twitter questions, but we have a live audience, so we can open it up to a live Q and A. We got a microphone that we can pass around. If anyone has a question for Who's any better, of us, Twitter Rick or real Dixay. people? <laughs> we have a question from. Dave Stewart uh, Dave. in the audience. Rumble Sue, let's go. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to ask, because you guys both have experience with Dardock, and we talked a lot about the personalities, and that was a big story heading in, and I think, like, he had his best split as an NA player. You probably saw him at a time when, like, there were some more struggles. Like, I want to hear a little bit about his growth with, in your team and, like, how, like, your perceptions of him, like, when you, when you played with him. Uh, so, for me, I still think Dardock is... Um, you know, even though the way it kind of like ended on CLG wasn't you know, super ideal, it was, he was still a person I was like, oh, you know, I still want him to do well. Because from his time joining CLG to when he left, like his, he had changed like so much. And I could see that he really wanted to. And just talking to him a lot one-on-one, -on -one, I could tell, you know, where his mindset's at, where his mentality's at and stuff like that. And I really know that he did want to, you know, change himself for the better. And he actually tried to do that, so. So I had a... I've had a number of opportunities in recruiting and trying to uh, pull Dardock into our, our ecosystem. Uh, and for me, as, as I'd watched him over the first year I was in the LCS and then even the second year, what I saw, I saw a lot of in Kobe Bryant, someone that I saw come in at the age of 17 when I was 30 years old. And I saw a young guy that was really hell-bent on leaving a mark career-wise in the game, uh, fighting for respect, wanting to like live among the, the legends of the game. And, and was so singularly focused towards that, uh, that it was, the, it was the focus of an individual athlete, needing to understand he was playing a team sport. And so where the frustrations and the, the lack of grace came into play, as I was watching across you know, the last few years, I just saw a 17-year-old kid, then an 18-year-old kid, and then I, I saw a young man trying to figure it out. Now, that's so difficult when you're in the spotlight, you're, you're being judged, you're being critiqued, you're being, and you're struggling with that aspect of finding your, your, you know, your chi among teamwork, right? And I just thought we, could, I thought we could help him with that. But what I discovered when he got to us was that he was already doing the work to figure that out. So we can't, our organization really can't take the credit for what we've seen this year from him, which is obviously growth. Um, but if you ask him, 
he tell you he's got so much further to go. Uh, but I think he values um, being an LCS player, being in League of Legends. I know he values creating longevity in that. And he's not prepared to risk that again. Uh, and so I think he has a clear understanding of the effect he has on his teammates now. Right? He has the effect, I think, both positively and negatively. He has the ability to uplift them like I've seen him do. And at the same time, he can drag them down if he... And so that's just an understanding of your your own individual power within not only the game, but among your team and your teammates. And he's just grown in that way. And so I'm really, we're, look, we couldn't be prouder of his progress, and we've only had him for a split. Uh, I hope that those that have interacted with him before can celebrate where he's gotten to now because uh, he's a part of our ecosystem. Like, he, if Kobe, where's, Kobe, where's basketball without Kobe Bryant for 20 years? You know, so I think those people that hated Kobe when he was 17 to, to 25, you know, stood up and cheered when he was in his 20th year and was like out of respect for his growth. Any other questions in the audience? So I want to one day become a pro player too. And for the first time ever, like in solo queue, I'm playing with people like, like these names that you guys are talking about. And I just wanted to wonder how important do you think solo queue really is? For someone like me who wants to become like a pro or something like that, that sounds like a mistake. Yeah. question. Yeah, or stick yeah. Santa, you are. We're all too boosted to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> so the floor goes to you. <laughs> so I guess, like back in, sounds weird to say this, but back in my day, you know, three, two, three years ago, twenty-year-old size. Yeah, th three years ago, um, when I was not a professional player and you know I, it was pretty much like you had to play solo queue to prove yourself and kind of get noticed and stuff like that and I still do think that matters I think that if you can play solo queue and you know climb to top 10 challenger and constantly play versus pros and just do really well versus them they're gonna notice you and be like oh wow like you know this guy's pretty good and so yeah I definitely think it matters uh, besides that you know I think collegiate is probably like the best way just collegiate and playing a lot of solo queue I, I would definitely add on uh, to Rick's point earlier. He was talking about the power that the players have. If you do mm -hmm. in, like play against LCS players and impress mm -hmm. LCS players, they will tell their Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. It, it, word travels. Yeah. And, 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 and know this. When you make it to the pro... Do you still solo queue? Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> okay. But, well, that's because he still Did solo queues. Right? Yeah, so... So... <laughs> So, no, so no, no, know this that that's that's a that's like that's no different than a, a a player going to the gym and getting 500 shots up, right? You're ma you're creating mastery in your craft, right? And every chance you can get opposite a level, a guy that's that level or that's in it, you should be hunting those opportunities down until it's your opportunity to be hunted, because that's the hunger, right? That's so when we hear of players. Uh, who want to? You say you want to be a pro. I keep saying, don't be a pro. Be a professional, yeah. okay? Because that's what sticks. That's what we look for, right? I, I tell kids all the time. I, I've done tours in our, our our training facility where parents come with their kids and they want to understand what this is. They have all this anxiety around letting their kids chase this dream that you're chasing. And I try to explain to the to the both sides, the parent. Look, your anxiety is because you don't have an understanding of this space. Let me give you an understanding. When I was growing up, I wanted to be an NBA basketball player. No one said, what are you talking about, right? Why? Because everyone understood what that led to, right? I could get a scholarship in college. I could go on and play in the pros and make millions of dollars. Okay, well, what happens if I was the small percentage that didn't make it? What did that mean for my parent, right, that knew that I loved basketball? Well, I could be a coach. I could be a broadcaster, I could be a uh, trainer, I could be an analyst, I could be an agent. I, there was all these career paths, right? That you knew that if you fell short, you could still live in that arena, in that business, right? And, and make a living. So as a parent, <laughs> so but as, a, as a parent that's trying to raise their kid to go off in the world and take care of themselves, there's a lot of anxiety when you don't know that this this, this ecosystem, it's filled with job opportunities. If you are one of the best that understand the space and understand what you do to a high level, you, you make this go. You end up making this go. So I tell the kid, I need players that are not only skilled, 
right? That only that don't that put, haven't only put all the repetition in to become so skilled, and then and I need players that are talented because believe it or not, people don't understand this. What he does, talent wise. Now, ta- you know what talent is, right? Talent is like God given ability you get from your parents, right? His parents spit him out and something went right genetically (laughs) that fit in this ecosystem on a level that's unfortunately special and different than a whole hell of a lot of people. You can say you want to do what he does, but I'm telling you on a genetic level, he's going to do it a lot easier than you might be able to do it for whatever reason, okay? So that's just talent. That doesn't speak to his attitude about things, right? Because the only way you stick around and become a professional, not just a pro, there's a lot of talented people. There's a lot of people that go and spend a lot of time and get the skills. It's where's your attitude in the equation, okay? So if you have those three things, those three things all linked up, you want to be hunting this guy and getting opportunity, right? But at the same time, you want to be hunted because that means you're in the ecosystem as one of the top guys. And then that's when the fear kicks in because you want to stay there and you realize, oh, I better keep working harder and harder and harder. So it's not just about working hard to get there in solo queue. It's about maintaining and getting better. Mm-hmm. That's the one thing the greats do. And I said, greats separate themselves. The difference between me and Kobe, I mean, look, I was actually bigger than Kobe, okay? <laughs> uh, not this Kobe. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> You're bigger than me too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what separated Kobe from being one of the top 10 players ever to play the game and me was from here, the shoulders up. That's a fact. That's just a fact. The legends have something up here They see it differently, they process it faster, they understand how to to impact others around them, they make the others around them better than they actually are, even if they are the greats in the game themselves. That's the difference. So aspire to be one of those greats. Don't just, you know, don't just aspire to get in. Like, we need people like you to be great. And even to go back to the original question of, like, does solo queue matter? I think League is so amazing in the fact that you can actually play against Kobe in solo queue. Like, oh, it, that's incredible. Like, how many basketball, aspiring basketball players would have been able to play against Kobe Bryant in a pickup game? Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. But now you actually can if you especially climb to the top of Challenger. Like, and you can recognize talent even if you don't know who he is. So I was spectating uh, a high elo Challenger game earlier this year and I saw a player that was named like QWEQR or something <laughs> and I was watching his gangplank. And he took over the game. Like they were down ten thousand gold, and then I, I did some research, and it was Hooney. Like he was already <laughs> a pro player, and he was smashing the soldier. He was like, if no one's picking this guy up, they're going to. And it turns out he was the best top player in the league already. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. On top of that, like if you if you're playing against the players, they know who's good. Yeah. So like even a guy like Viper, who was a riven one trick is on Team Liquid Academy now, getting the opportunity to widen his champion pool. And you're gonna have to be able to do all those things. Like you need to still be able to make the step, but the talent gets recognized if it's there through Soul Cube. Can I bring up a question? I'm just gonna throw this on the table. I know this, we had an owner's meeting tomorrow, so we'll deal with this tomorrow, but <laughs> we have t- we only were allowed to bring one sub. Sure. Right? So you talk about a guy that's a, a, a riven one trick that's gonna grow his into more than just a one trick, right? But there's a value in a guy that, say, just rebounds and blocks shots, mm-hmm. right? There's a value in a guy that has the ability to kill a gangplank and a ribbon, right? And hasn't worked out the other aspects yet, right? I want that guy here with me. I want the five guys, and I want my five guys that are su- substitutes that are specialists or experts that I can throw in and mix up my, 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 my lineup and bring a surprise to the equation, right? That might throw throw things. So I, I, I kind of go like, I'd love to see that. I mean, we have the academy team and we have the starters, and I think a ten man roster is great. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to be able to come up with some comps and some lineups that can't be predicted uh, from game one to game two or game two to five. You know, that's something we actually talked about on the dive in the past. And I think it could be pretty cool, especially you know. I think a change that would have to go with that is the ability to actually choose who is playing after pick ban, you know, because then one tricks and things like mm-hmm. that can become pretty useful, right? If it is that gangplank matchup, you blind pick a gangplank mm-hmm. and you can sub in your ribbon one trick to smash that, that becomes pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but the last thing about your solo queue question that I would actually say is, I think one of the most important things is not just how skillful you are, but also your attitude. Uh, mm-hmm. Because solo queue is playing like a super isolated state. It doesn't matter if you can get to the top of the ladder and you can blast whoever you want to blast, like that's great. But if you are horrible to play with, if you are not fun to play with, if you have a poor attitude, 
like he doesn't want to play with you. Like this guy is going to be your advocate. If you get into games with him and every game you're smashing and you're fun to play with, he becomes your advocate. If you get in games every game you're smashing, you're, you're flaming your teammates, you're quitting early and you're doing those sort of things, then the pro players are going to be the ones who equally will keep you out of the scene because no one's going to want to play with you. So like that's something, something I think let me tell you something. We're watching. Of, yeah. We are all watching. <laughs> <laughs> he knows where you sleep. I'm telling you. We are, we are watching. Don't believe we're not watching. Um, and we're watching when you don't think we're watching. Because, because no, I mean, I realize that because, because we watch Santa Claus. <laughs> because we want to, we want to know who, we want to know your true essence. Yeah. We want to know what you're like in game when things aren't going well. We want to know what you're like after the game. Because that same, that same energy after the game and in the chat on the side when you're like flaming everybody, right? And blaming everybody. We, we see that stuff. We see it, and it tells us everything we need to know. Because then, why would we invite that into our our training facility, right? Splits are, now granted, we're not getting relegated, but splits are too short, right? We had 10 weeks to get it right, and we got another 10 weeks to get it right, right? And so, we don't need a bad apple pulling down the whole organization. Work too hard. All right, next question. Thank you very much for that solo queue one, it was great. Uh, I might be getting ahead of myself considering finals hasn't even happened yet. But what's NA shot at MSI? Are we going to see like another CLG Cinderella run? Stick set. Speaking as from CLG's second place finish two years ago, what do you think? So I actually think uh, whichever team wins, whether it's TL or Honey Thieves, I actually think they have a pretty decent shot. I think since they have so many like veterans on both teams, they have a pretty good chance to do well internationally. And I think most of them have played internationally before, so that helps a lot too. I had a follow-up, actually, um, because you guys were, you, you placed the best of any North American team in a Riot-sponsored international event. Um, was there anything that you experienced in that MSI run um, or that you learned during that run that was, say, different from like playing on the NA LCS stage or uh, you know, going against SKT and the, the types of planning that you, that you had to go through? Yeah, so I guess for me, I think the biggest thing that can impact a team is like if they can click. So, you know, for example, 100 Thieves, second split, you know, Clutch Gaming, I think, later on towards the split, I wouldn't say second, second half, but, you know, towards playoffs. Uh, it feels like when a team can kind of just click like that, like, they, they know what to do. And it gives them, like, such a better chance to win. And at MSI, like, I mean, going into it, we were losing every single game to Team Liquid Academy and scrims. Like, we lost, like, 20 games to, uh, versus them. And then going to MSI, you know, we're playing versus international competition, we're like, Okay, we need, we want to prove that we're good. Like we belong to beer. You know, everyone's saying, you know, these guys they won by one team fight in the finals. TSM should be here, stuff like that. And I don't know, something just kind of clicked with us, and we just kind of like wrote it all over the finals. I think I think there's. Granted, I've never been to MSI. <laughs> <laughs> Let me fully say that first. Uh, I think there's a narrative that's ru that runs through the NA um, for the last few years that I've been here is is that in some way we still have to prove that we belong on the international scene. Granted, that's true, uh, but belonging meaning winning, right? Winning the whole thing. Um, we belong because we're there, right? Um, but until we shift the narrative of going to an international event to simply win, as opposed to prove that we should be there, I think that shift has to happen first. Uh, and and that, that's, that's, a, that's more of a mental block than, than um, an ability to do or not do. If you're there only for, like, like we never would, pres that's, it's like a team saying, I, we just want to make the playoffs. And then you get to the playoffs, and you're like, oh shit, there's a championship on the line. <laughs> but we, we did what we said we were looking to do, right? Well, if you say you're, you're going to MSI to prove you belong, you get there and you win one or two games, like, oh, we belong. But then there's still the winning the MSI thing. If you go to win the MSI, you're just there to win MSI. You already belong. You won the NA split. <laughs> so, so that's just a mindset. Uh, uh, I think that if we can get through, we'll win MSI. Hi. So this question is mainly um, aimed at Mr. Mr. Fox or anybody else if they have um, something they'd like to add on. Uh, as a former NBA player, how do you think? Um, over your career as an owner, what do you think the parallels between the NBA or more traditional scenes are 
to the growing esports scene and how in your in your circle of peers or to fans and such how <laughs> difficult if at all is it to kind of explain what esports are what league of legends is and um to say that this is actually a a big upcoming thing that's going to be pretty popular in the future i think well i think uh, thank or you for your question now. yeah i think it's way past uh um, getting people to understand how popular it is i mean if you you either living under a rock or or you you, you just you know your interests are completely oh, different uh from sport or competition uh we you know the parallels i've been i've been on track now for a couple of years answering that question and um and to tell you the honest truth, sport is sport, competition is competition, and you either get it or you don't. Uh, and so to have to drill down into the nuances, I would say, well, you know, you don't, a, 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 an NBA player doesn't train like a baseball player. A baseball player doesn't train like a NASCAR driver. Like it just, so if, if we're talking traditional sports as a whole, I don't think we care to be accepted by a traditional sport model if what what they don't understand is sport is sport, right? And, and so there's just there's a bit of territorial like ownership that's going on at times that I th I really think they think we need acknowledgement for, which we don't. We don't. Really, uh, do you guys care about it? No. No. <laughs> so, so like like that's the thing I've discovered. Like I don't I don't care if they it, no one's waiting for them to come by and go. Okay, you guys are now accepted. It's like, okay, well, what? Like, okay, whatever. Like, we're doing our own thing. And if it, the thing that's been probably more affirming for me, being from traditional sports, being here today, is I entered it as a video game. I love video games. I played them my entire life. I played them with my son. That's how I entered the space. It wasn't from, like, a basketball place looking to get into League of Legends. And the thing that's probably been most is when that happened, Apparently, people perceived me to have the answer to why I was that, that, that we should be over there. The traditional sports should be. And I was like, I, and so I get all these calls from all these other, you know, NBA teams and Major League Soccer and football. And I spent the first. It's probably why we sucked the first year. I spent the first year <laughs> answering all these questions about what I was doing in League of Legends. And I went to an event. I'll never forget the Future of Sports in Boston. And it was seventy traditional sport owners there and we went up and we were the esport panel to explain to them about esports and everyone's questions really were came from a defensive place like very protective like what is this esports thing and what are they trying to take from us <laughs> right <laughs> they're stealing our audience and our our the youth of america from us right and it's like what how can we stop that how can we stop <laughs> uh, how can we prevent this and i was kind of like guys the, like that's like stopping the internet like or stopping social media like what do you you guys are you're being foolish if you're really going to spend all your energy trying to stop something when the tsunami has already hit the shore like it's too late Right? If you haven't been listening to the generation below you, just because you were raised in a generation that said, put down the controller and get out the house, if, you've been, if you think that's what the world looks like down here where you guys are living, then you're really one step away from being out of a job anywhere in the world because you're not evolving with the times. Right? Because the generation today is saying, this is how we want to compete. This is how we express ourselves. This is what we watch. This is what we're into. And these are our professional athletes. So you don't have to be a part of it. We're going to go where they go. Right? And so that's so after I told them, look, you either can continue to be defensive about it or you can be offensive about it and realize that you're going to lose an audience and a generation of consumers of competition and sport because you're over there trying to still sell them one thing that they're not interested in. So from that standpoint, at a certain point, I think you've seen the offensive approach showed up to the, you know, to the, mm -hmm. to the landscape and everyone wanted to know how they could get in, how they could be a part of it because they put down their old, uh, the old way of thinking that in a certain way it needed to be, sport needed to be defined by something they created. Instead, something else was created over here, right? <laughs> and they're either going to want to be a part of it or not. And so... I think the more we just stop, you know, and I don't, we're not doing it, but the more, you know, we stop even answering, oh, no, no disrespect, 
stop answering these questions, um, it, the less power it has, right? So, so I don't want to give that any power because I'm not. I, they do what they want to do. We're going to keep doing what we're doing, and if they respect what we're doing, maybe we'll let them in. All right. <laughs> Got time for one uh, final question. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey, this question is for anyone in general. My question is, um, in the LCK patch right now, it's uh, patch ahead, right? For playoffs? Yeah, 8.6. Yeah, compared to NA LCS, which is patch behind. My question would be to anyone who wants to answer, um, what do you think should be the defining factor on how teams' adaptability to respond to a patch versus should they be given more time to practice on the patches? Oh. And like, what's the, what's the argument for that? Yeah, uh, I think this question is uh, kind of as old as esports um, because there's been a, there's been a lot of shifts to and fro. Right now in LCS, it's a week after the patch hits, you're able to play it on the live servers, but the patch then remains stable for any duration of playoffs. So that's why Worlds is always on the Worlds patch that runs for the entire five weeks. That's why NILCS is on 8.5 because essentially if it was on 8.6, they wouldn't have had the same time to adapt. And the reason Korea and China are on 8.6 is their playoffs start later. So I, for my opinion, Riot's stance is always adaptability is an incredibly key part of the game, part of the game, and you need to be able to do it. But you also shouldn't be forced to do it in the middle of the tournament. And regular season has enough like length that the volatility can be kind of average for. So that's kind of the shortest answer I can give. I'd also say like I think one of the cool things about League of Legends as an esport is that when you are playing at home, when you are playing solo queue, you are playing something that is very similar to what you're actually watching on the screen. And that's why I think it's actually really nice that the, the patches are pretty pretty quickly coming to, to what you have on solo queue, right? So we can try out new things and be like, oh, hey, is this going to work in pro? Is this going to be something that is, is there? Um, I think as a pro, sometimes you probably want some things to, to stay more the same, but the reality is for the health of the eSport, the game itself needs to be healthy too, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think games need to stay fresh, games need to stay fun, uh, otherwise you, you lose a lot of the audience, right? Like people want to be engaged, and I think the changes are a lot of fun to explore and to play and, and to try out when things change. And we've made mistakes in this area before, admittedly, uh, you know, the Juggernaut patch and... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Were you a fan? Uh, I was watching it. Yeah. Um, so like, it's definitely a learning process, but the adaptability and, and being able to learn things quickly is something that we want to test for professional players. I know even just recently, Bjergsen, um, you know, guy at the very top peak play, uh, said that some of the most interesting things to him is when a new patch hits and trying out these different things to try and get his new edge somewhere. Um, like when you get to that top level of play, that's the that's a new thing to look forward to, right? So it's a balance of, like he said, keeping it stable for uh, playoffs or worlds, you know, big tournaments and stretches like that and avoiding juggernaut things right before that. Um, but then also having that certain amount of, uh, of change still be important. That's so interesting that you brought up Bjergsen and his approach to a past shift. That's like the difference in the legends, right? Yeah. So they're not, they're, not, they're not complaining about a past shift. They've turned it into an a way to gain an advantage. And, and that's for two years I've been like trying to figure out how to gain an advantage every time a patch right. shifts. How to, how to be first to, to find those advantages quicker than your opponent. Watch the dive. Yeah, no, no. Trust, hey, listen, trust me, I'm listening. Um, Everyone's there. Yeah, I know. Trust me, I'm listening. Um, uh, but that's because that's the game within the game, right? It's it's being first to find those those new opportunities. Yeah. And it's super tough, right? Because there are patches that are better for some teams than other teams. We know a four was the biggest patch we had in the year. And it's it's a system that the balance team has kind of gone through a while as well. Like the midseason patch is huge; they don't drop that until before a split. Mm -hmm. The preseason patch is also huge; that's months before the split. But pretty much every split, there's a pretty large patch in the middle of the regular season. That's their last chance to get anything big in before playoffs because you don't want that to drop right before playoffs. But it's still a big change. Like. It's one of the only sports that makes rule changes of this magnitude in the middle of the season. Yeah, like mm -hmm. the NBA makes rule changes pretty mm -hmm. frequently. Yeah, like yeah. every year yep. they will do something, yep. whether or not it's the way they change a hand checking rule or where the three point line is or how they call defensive three seconds, like a lot of different stuff. But that's a yearly thing. 
These guys have to adapt to those things within the week, but because it's so frequent, the ability to adapt to it is a defining characteristics of the guys who can stick around. Yeah. There's so a lot of rookies true. that do it on the first patch and then the first big patch yeah, hits and yeah. now you can't play tank jungles. Now you're done. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Oh, sorry. Oh. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so I think my thoughts are pretty aligned with like that where you're saying, you know, like pro players, one of the traits they need to have is that ability. And I remember, I think a few members of uh, C9 were really vocal about this. You know, everyone's complaining about, oh, this meta is just so boring. This meta is, you know, this champion's broken, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I remember a few C9 players were saying like, there's no reason to complain, like that's just the game, you know, it's going to change, you have to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a really good mindset to have. And um, in terms of, I think you asked, uh, you know, how do they adapt fast? I think a lot of it is like, you know, when a new champion like Swain comes out, and I don't even think anyone played him on like the first week of when he was out, and then it just, it, it just takes some time, um, but typically the people who can find out what's the best, the fastest, is just going to win, or do the best on that patch. Yeah, I think that's the growing caliber of pro, right? How, how deep do you go? How deep do your skills go? How many champions are you, you know, adept in? And look at the look at the meta in Korea, right? Look what they're doing with pick bands there. I mean, it's Cassiopeia up on top. Like, oh, like, you know, you look at this stuff and you go, what that, no, Cassiopeia is a minute. Like, you're not, and you realize, no, it's the, the caliber of pro, the confidence with which they have in their champion pool allows the flexibility within their team to create these comps and put situations and put their team in a position to blitz someone out of nowhere and they're like, what just happened? What, where's, where'd that big band come from? Right? And I've grown to love, you know, the shifts. Because even though if they're in our favor for, you know, the first 10 games, because 8.3 was amazing, it showed us our weaknesses. It showed us where we needed to get better to be able to compete in the summer. If we wouldn't, if we'd have been 8.3 all the way through the spring, we would have got to the summer and we'd say, oh, everything's great, right? But you need to know where those holes are to get better for what? The ultimate thing is to do what? Go to MSI and be prove you're worth it or no? Go to Worlds and win the Worlds. That's my point, right? So all of those changes give you a look at all the different ways you need to improve. And that's, I love it now. I used to hate it. For a year one, I used to be, I hate it. But now I love it. All right, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Dixie. Thanks, everyone, for the questions uh, from FIU for coming out. That'll do it for the first episode of The Dive in front of a live audience. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>